Over the millennia of the Imperium of Man's existence, many great generals and war leaders have come and gone. Probably the most famous of these are drawn from the ranks of the Astartes or those above them, but the Astra Militarum has had its fair share too. The arguable greatest of these human generals led a vast crusade of conquest that saw unprecedented numbers of worlds fall in record time, but it would end in mysterious circumstances and the newly taken space would quickly fall apart. Now consecrated after death as an imperial saint, hailing from a world renamed in his honour, he was the Lord Sola Mercarius. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. Mercarius was born in 356 M41 on the world of Donia in southern Segmentum Pacificus, near to the border between the Segmentum and Segmentum Solar. Exactly what sort of world it was has been seemingly forgotten due to the things that changed on it after Macarius died, but the future Lord Solar likely didn't see much of whatever hardships its populace would have had to endure. He was the son and heir of planetary governor Pella, suggesting some form of feudal or autocratic society on Donia, and Macarius would find himself serving in the planet's Astra Militarum and or PDF regiments from a young age. By only 20 or so years old, Macarius had worked his way to the rank of general, or his privileged birth meant he was just given it or given a head start to it, and he excelled as both a battlefield commander and a campaign strategist. This was all well and good, but stuck on some random planet in Segmentum Pacificus, it was possible that Macarius would have been nothing but a local legend, or maybe a renowned general in one corner of the Militarum if he was able to go further afield. As it happened, that wouldn't be the case, due in large amount to the events of a revolt on Donia itself called the Roxane Rebellion in 379 M41. Macarius masterminded large chunks of the imperial victory over the rebels, including slaying the overall rebel leader. But again, this is still local stuff that wouldn't cause him to have become a legend the Imperium over. As it happened, however, Lord Commander of Segmentum Pacificus itself, Lord Commander Solar Phillips, was on Donia, presumably as part of the wider Imperial response to the rebels, or maybe because Macarius' legend was spreading to draw his attention. Said rebels were actually able to capture Phillips somehow, and Macarius led a successful operation to rescue the Lord Solar. It is believed that Phillips had already taken Macarius as a deputy or an understudy before this moment, but the two were certainly working together afterwards. In fact, once the wider rebellion was over, Phillips didn't just take Macarius as a student, he went so far as to name him successor as Lord Commander Solar. For the next seven years, Macarius will have fought alongside and separately from Phillips according to the needs of the Segmentum, honing his skills further as a commander with much larger forces to work with. He came to meet many of his most trusted comrades and subordinates in this period or during his campaigns on Donia, and when Phillips was slain in 386 M41 during a campaign known as the Lemoore Landings, Macarius inherited the office of Lord Solar as intended. As part of his inauguration as Lord Solar, he travelled to Terra itself, since that's where the Lord Commander Militant, essentially the highest ranked Militarum official, is based. It may surprise you that this was actually Macarius' only trip to Terra in his life, but that's possibly a factor based on circumstance as much as anything else. Returning to Segmentum Pacificus once he was properly sworn into office, Lord Solar Macarius went on a campaign of conquest across a number of worlds, with the armies of Donia he had once led seemingly forming the core of his now expanded forces. Little is known of these wars aside from the worlds he took, but the sheer number of conquests and the assumed rate of them would set a trend for what was to come. After these initial victories, Macarius went on the record for the first time with the idea of leading a grand crusade all of his own. His dream was to lead the largest campaign since the Great Crusade itself, an attempt to bring swathes of the galaxy into the Imperial Fold, just as the Emperor and the Primarchs had done ten millennia prior. 
And would you believe he would be able to somewhat realise that dream in the campaign now widely known as the Makarian Crusade. It began officially in 392 M41, though I suspect Macarius had spent years planning and coordinating the required resources ahead of time, with Donia itself being the staging ground and launching point for the Crusade. Since it was already in Segmentum Pacificus, if Macarius wanted new worlds to integrate and conquer, then the most logical direction for the Crusade to go was west, and so that's where they went. Some planets in their way were former Imperial worlds that had rebelled or otherwise been lost, with the Age of Apostasy being a major reason and cause for said losses. But there was plenty of new stuff out there too, all the way to the Galactic Rim. However, like many Grand Imperial Crusaders both past and future, Macarius didn't keep his entire force, known as the Grand Army of Reconquest, under one banner in one place at any time. It would have been horrendously inefficient and, well, ridiculous overkill as well. Instead, the Crusade was split into seven of what are known as army groups, with Macarius leading one and those aforementioned comrades and subordinates leading the other six. Many Space Marine chapters also lent their blades and bolters to Macarius' banner alongside the Collegia Titanica and the Questor Imperialis, assumedly fighting either for glory, both personal and imperial, or due to some prior relationship with Macarius, his generals, or maybe even Phillips that brought them along for the ride. The campaign began in a system known as Cask, pitting Macarius' own army group against the unwittingly chaotic cult known as the Cult of the Angel of Fire. The fighting was especially brutal, definitely so in the early exchanges and the landings, but the inspiring charisma of Macarius helped keep things moving forward when many lesser generals would have watched their armies break and their campaigning dreams fall apart. In the closing stages of the invasion, Macarius was forced to face down a Lord of Change, promising him power if only he would serve chaos. The Lord Sola was somehow able to maintain his purity and his sanity, and the greater demon was defeated, marking the first of many victories for the Macarian Crusade. Over the seven years of the Macarian Crusade that followed the battle in Cask, the Lord Sola and his generals went on a tear through Segmentum Pacificus, working ever westward and taking world after world after world. It is believed that within the first year of the Crusade, 100 worlds had been retaken or conquered across the various army groups, meaning that more than one world per month was apparently being brought into the fold by each of the seven groups. It is testament to the strategic planning of Macarius and co, as well as their warrior's skill at arms, that such a breakneck pace could be maintained, if not accelerated. The second year is thought to have seen twice as many worlds conquered as the first, and the third twice as many again. In the wake of the fast-moving army groups came the requisite authorities to establish the newly imperial world. The Adeptus Ministorum to set up the imperial creed, the Inquisition to root out trouble, and so on and so forth. Of course, Macarius was front and centre throughout the Crusade, leading his own group as well as being the Crusade's overall commander. He even moved to or worked alongside some of his generals and their armies from time to time, most notably early on alongside one of his closest friends, General Sejanus, on the world of Persepolis. This hive world had been out of contact with the Imperium for something like 5,000 years, but had refused to rejoin the fold, and it was one of the first worlds taken by the Crusade whilst Macarius recovered a new unique helm from an ancient explorer's tomb. The Lord Sola was revered by his soldiers, but it never went to his head. It was a conquest for the God Emperor and the Imperium, not for Macarius's glory, and one could arguably say that he was rewarded for this spirituality and for his success. You see, what can arguably only be described as miracles happened to or around Macarius on his campaigns. Most notably, he was shot square in the chest by a heretic Astartes on the world of Saga IV in the second year of the Crusade. However, for some inexplicable reason, the shell did not explode and the Lord Sola survived, which was spun by the Ecclesiarchy around him as a sign of the Emperor's grace. Whether it was or not will likely never be known, we can't exactly ask the Emperor, but you could see why some might betray it that way and buy into that idea. 
In fact, by the time of the Crusades end, Macarius was seen as a god of sorts by some of his troops, though hopefully he wasn't reveling in it and would rather have just got on with his fighting. And there was, of course, a lot of fighting in the Crusade, and Macarius kept himself busy with his own army group as well as aiding his subordinates in their own conflicts. He joined in the conquests of worlds, including helping to crack a highly advanced planet and society that had all but annihilated an army group single-handedly over two years. Granted, he had to crash a comet into it, but it worked. Macarius didn't have it all his own way, though. It's believed that the Macarian Crusade never actually lost, though this may just be imperial hyperbole and spin, but it was a bumpy road to victory on more than one occasion. At one point, Macarius's forces somehow managed to accidentally run into an orc war. They defeated it, but Macarius himself was severely wounded by the war boss. During the event known as the Battle of Tarak Dis, the first flagship of the Lord Solar, Pax Imperium, was almost destroyed, though Macarius survived and moved his command to a new vessel, the Lord of Light. There was even an apparent incident where the demon known as the Changeling took on the guise of Macarius on a planet called Garana. It is believed that the tricks the demon attempted to sow chaos from within, issuing orders of retreat whilst Macarius was pushing forward on the front lines. The events that followed are not recorded, but it was probably rather confusing for some and likely led to more than a few casualties. But despite these hiccups and setbacks, the Macarian Crusade kept rolling on at a frightening speed. By the time it ended, it is thought that around a thousand worlds have been newly assimilated or brought to heel by the Lord Solar and his generals, and so much territory had been covered that the Crusade had reached the end of the range for the guiding light of the Astronomicon. When measured against pretty much any other Imperial Crusade, especially ones that only lasted seven years as this one did, it was an unqualified and roaring success. But Macarius wasn't done. He wanted more. Much, much more. Given the chance, the Lord Solar would have kept marching forward until he finally dropped dead. And arguably, he almost did exactly that. Though not the last conquest, which was actually not made by the First Army Group, many point to the battle on the industrial world of Loki as the beginning of the end for the Makarian Crusade, due to its effects on the Lord Solar. For those who don't know the title, by the way, this is a warmast in all but name, but no one in the Imperium uses the title due to the negative connotations linked to Horus. Just as Philips had taken Macarius under his wing all those decades before, Macarius had taken a protege of his own, an individual known as Richter. However, Richter had chosen to rebel against his superior and turn traitor for admittedly unknown reasons, setting up Loki as a stronghold and all but fully converting to the worship of Nurgle. Macarius's ability to lead was compromised by the grinding warfare and possibly the fact that he was having to fight someone he had trained, and the war for Loki took a heavy toll on him and his already exhausted forces. Some even began to question Macarius's command and ability, though likely not within earshot of him or any of his more diehard loyalists. And it all came to a head after Macarius and Sejanus's second army conquered a world known today as Ultima Macaria. Beyond it lay the region of space known as the Halo Stars, where the Astronomican could not reach. Navigators refused to go, and many soldiers felt broadly the same way. Sejanus reported to Macarius that Ultima Macaria would be the end of things, hence why it got its name. The soldiers were exhausted from near constant war over seven years, and they and the other generals wouldn't go any further beyond the light of the Emperor. Macarius is thought to have been furious, retreating into a drunken stupor, but he eventually relented and called the Macarian Crusade to an end. However, the Lord Solar, probably being set up for a ginormous victory parade and honours on Terra itself, would never even make it back to Donia, Terra, or possibly any Imperial space, certainly nothing he hadn't already personally conquered. Officially, he had contracted a form of jungle fever late in the Crusade, and the disease caught up with and killed him before the Crusade could make it home, though some cynics claim he had chose to die on his own terms, since the dead would not show the cowardice of his wishing to retreat soldiers. 
However, it is instead believed that what ailed Macarius was some Nurgle-based malediction that he had contracted fighting Richter's forces on Loki. As such, the Officio Assassinorum deployed an agent to take the Lord Solar out, lest he be corrupted as Richter had been. It is believed this happened on Loki, but this would clash with other records, and so I assume it happened instead during the Crusades' return voyage. Whatever the exact truth of the matter, Lord Solar Macarius died before he could get home, and in death, he was unsurprisingly canonised as an imperial saint in recognition of his deeds and his piety. Donia was renamed as Macaria in his honour and became a shrine world, and arguably only the returning Robert Gilliman's Indomitus Crusade has come even close to matching the success of the Macarian Crusade. But alas, it wouldn't just be that simple. Without Macarius to hold it all together, the generals below him gave in to greed and a lust for their own power. The regions the Crusader conquered were splintered into smaller empires that warred amongst themselves and against the Imperium, whilst even the Space Marines seemed to bicker amongst themselves at times. This period, known as the Macarian Heresy, lasted for 70 long, gruelling years, 10 times longer than the Crusade itself that had conquered them, and only a second full-blown crusade led by a war master Solon was able to restore most but not all worlds to the Imperial fold. If Macarius did choose to die on his own terms due to the cowardice of his soldiers, I suspect he was turning in his grave if he ever heard of what happened after he was gone. So ends the tale of Lord Commander Solar Macarius. Born into nobility with a gift for the military arts, he was perhaps a one-of-a-kind commander that may never be seen again in the Imperium. His conquests were all but unprecedented, his skills unparalleled outside of the Astartes and the like, and his inspirational presence was able to hold together an empire far beyond what might be considered reasonable. And yes, I will call what he conquered an empire, it was big enough. But he was not perfect, far from it, even if history looks on his work with a very favourable eye. For now though, we must move on to our next topic of discussion. I think another trip back in time is in order for our next log, at least if we're going to start at the beginning of the tale. It'll be less of a story and more of a reference log of collated information, but the power of the individuals and their role in their race as society should be highlighted for aiding in combating them as well as for posterity. Thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.